KTN News as well in the studio with you. As always, every weekday morning is Eric Latif, Ndu Oko, CT Muga. And now we're joined in the studio by Her Excellency Kirsty Kalulide, the president of Estonia, the Good world's morning. most advanced digital society. Good morning. Good morning, Kenya. <laughs> it's good to have you in the studio. Welcome to the Situation Room. This is where we have Kenya's biggest conversations. And we're glad that you have joined us to have this conversation with us. How do you say good hello in, uh, in Estonian? I am We've going to assassinate the language completely, but Your Excellency, bear with me. I wrote it down, and I hope I can read it correctly. Kuidas sul laheb. Thank you. Karibu sana. Ah. <laughs> it goes really well. Kuidas <laughs> sul laheb. I, I think you have used this Google Translate and then audio uh, version. Yes, there. I actually <laughs> listen to that Google Translate <laughs> exactly. a number of times. Yes, because I can recognize the intonation of Google Estonian. Oh. But it was good, <laughs> very natural. Thank you. So how would you say it? Exactly the same way. Oh. Kuidas sul lahab. But I would say kuika. Kuidas sul lahab. Mm. Oh, kuidas sul lahab. Oh, quicker. Yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> but thank you for having me, and, and I, I see Kenya is doing great, and, uh, and I really believe that we can do good things together. You mm. started from uh, our digital prowess, and, uh, and I believe that this country has so much potential to leapfrog with the help of technologies. Indeed. We shall be getting to that conversation, and you'll tell us how you got to where you are right now as a country. You're in the country for a couple of days. What brings you to Kenya? Uh, actually, it's my last state visit while in office as a president of the Republic of Estonia, and it's very fitting that it comes to an African country, because uh, I was the one who led the Estonian campaign for United Nations Security Council, and I really fell in love with this continent while we were doing it. And, and it obviously became clear to us that Estonia, despite that we are one million people and, and uh, well, just exited the middle-income countries rank, we are now a lower-level rich country, mm. but we can contribute to the development of this continent by by using our own example, because, you know, 30 years ago, Estonia regained its independence. We were occupied by the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and then we regained our independence, and an average salary then was about $30 per month. Now it's 1,500 euros per month. And we have, I mean, in these 30 years, we have done things differently. And, mm -hmm. and I believe this is maybe the message what we can really share with our brothers and sisters here in Africa, that if people come and tell you that if you do these things, which we did before you, mm -hmm. then you will catch up. I was already 20 years ago when I was advising Prime Minister of Estonia, I was wondering if I do what you did and do it 30 years, 40 years later, how on earth am I going to catch up? Yeah. No way! Mm -hmm. So you have to do things your own way differently to find leapfrogging opportunities. And I see here this kind of thinking uh, on the whole continent, particularly if I look at the African Union, mm -hmm. which is really ready to take responsibility for the development of the four freedoms, the free movement of people, capital uh, in Africa, and, and also the digital development. I, I really appreciate what I'm seeing in Africa and also here in, in Kenya. Mm. That's why. Your Excellency, take us back 30 years to where you're saying this is where Estonia basically just started uh, putting on into gear 6, into gear 7. Now you're, I think, on 15th gear. But just take us back to those 30 years ago. How was Estonia? What was happening in the country? It was a country where people didn't have bank accounts where people didn't pay taxes because in Soviet Union then they didn't pay your salary, therefore you didn't pay taxes. Mm. It was a country which had lost all its economic connections because they were, I mean, forged towards Soviet Union. But this ecosystem disappeared. It was a country which regained its independence and which realized it has to become part of the multilateral free world to protect this independence. So rule of law, institutions which have their own right to operate in the society, all this needed to be created. And then we set out to do it. And Estonian people, when we regained independence, we wanted to do everything differently than how it had been under the occupation, mm -hmm. which obviously meant that, I mean, personal freedoms and personal rights became extremely important in Estonia. Our constitution is very strong on all that. And this actually unleashed also the economic potential because, you know, only free people are truly I mean, creative. Mm. You cannot be creative in business if you're not free. If you're afraid that somebody takes your business away or treats your business differently because, I mean, you are not friends with, uh, with the political elite or something. And, and this way we started, step by step. And then we realized that our people expect government services. 
but we do not have government offices. But we also noticed that private companies already did everything on uh, in internet and online. And for example, banking went online in Estonia in 1994 because banks had the same problem. Estonians were very poor mm. and they live far from each other. We are not a densely populated place. So it didn't pay off to have bank offices. So they offered online services. And the government was watching and said, but we want also to do the same way. First online service was tax office. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to see the taxman. Estonians have never seen a taxman because you do it online. Yeah. And, and we realized this is our way forward. And what we really didn't realize was that we are the only ones in, also in, in Europe who think this way. Mm -hmm. We thought, I mean, in a couple of years time, everybody would be doing what we are doing. Because in Estonia, we don't separate the world into private sector and the government. And we do not, not expect government to provide a, a lower level of service than his private sector. Mm. Frankly speaking, we didn't know this is a normality in many countries. <laughs> and, and we were very astonished when we started to put out public uh, services online and everybody was like, how are you doing it? We mm. said exactly like Amazon or Google or, or newspapers or I mean exactly the same way, why are you asking? And indeed, uh, we didn't think it will not be the same in, uh, in every country. We expected everybody to do the same. And uh, now they are doing the same, but it took 20 years. Mm. 20 years is not a long time, though, Your Excellency. Uh, if you look 20, 30 years, it, if anybody looks at that situation, would say that it, it, it looks like there was a lot of work that was done in a very short period of time. What are some of the other ingredients that were applied to this process? Yeah, that's exactly. Estonians think 20 years is extremely long time because mm. we've only regained independence 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we think that in 20 years, it's a generation. You can grow a digital generation. And this is exactly what I think is now going to happen in, uh, in many African countries, including Ch Kenya. You, should, you, you, you are ready and your, your president says you want to go also the same way. Then you have to bring up a digital generation, register every baby's birth by mobile phone, offer them vaccination over online. This way you will also, I mean, grow your national population registry. You can attach all services to it. Mm. This can be done and it takes about 10 years. And, and your people really realize it's really comfortable that you don't have to go and queue in offices. I mean, it's, it's, it's just it's such a carrot for society to change mm. that it's so much more comfortable. And, and also digital offers you not only, I mean, this kind of digital, digital services, but I give you a really concrete example. Uh, uh, Kenyan Water Fund mm. uh, is just now when we are talking here, discussing with one Estonian company, Space Trip about the project where it's a pilot, 10,000 homes in Nairobi will have kind of water purification system, which is local, linked to a, a household, but controlled electronically, totally electronically handled, managed to make Nairobi River cleaner. And this is only a pilot, but you can do it, I mean, far easier than you would if you build a huge, I mean, sewage management plant. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes a long time to plan and, and then to build and, and the capital cost is huge, but you go a little by little and you can add households every day. Mm. And suddenly you will have a system which will actually make your river cleaner. Mm. And this way, only in connecting everything digitally, you can make dispersed systems act like previously we were used to having a big system. The same in energy, for example, in electricity grids. You don't need any more big plant. You can have small solar, solar systems with a little bit of a cells and it works. So you can kind of cut the initial capital cost very much by using digital connection of many, uh, well, thousands small systems. And this space trip project, I believe this is a really nice example. Your Excellency, you speak well of our country and we thank you. Given that uh, Kenya is a hub, a multilateral hub for businesses, for and travel, UN, UN if I may ask, has your government considered having an embassy? We, uh, we have uh, been gradually rising our visibility and, and presence in this country. Yes. Uh, and our business is now putting uh, a huge pressure on Minister of Foreign Affairs. I could see it yesterday evening when we had drinks with our delegation to have an embassy. Mm. We are represented at the, at the UN level here. 
and we have an honorary consul. Uh, uh, she's Estonian, very nice Estonian lady. But of course, they do a lot of things like Estonians always do. You don't have an ambassador, but you have a couple of people in the town. So of course, they act as if they were ambassadors. Mm. This is simply an Estonian way of moving things. Mm. But indeed, everybody is now demanding from our country that there is a lot of opportunity. Let's do an embassy. On the other hand, Estonia is a small country and we have very few embassies uh, in Africa at all. But you know, when we were doing our Security Council campaign, many people asked me that, I mean, why don't you establish embassies while you're campaigning? And I said, look, we have about maybe a million euros which we can annually spend in development programs, I mean, on this continent. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to establish a couple of houses with four limousines and six gentlemen? Or you want me to dedicate all these resources, let's say, for smart Africa, standardization, and, and everybody said the second. Mm -hmm. And then I said, hold on, the leaders of African nations, then you have to be my ambassadors to your countries, mm. because I'm not going to establish these embassies. I'm instead having a memorandum of understanding with African Union on digital development. So you see, we can do things differently, and mm. I'm, I'm quite sure that this kind of 21st century diplomacy works very well for small mobile countries. Mm. But indeed, our business today is putting a pressure to have an embassy here. Ah, good. Now, we'll talk about the plans that you had as a government. Uh, 20 years, there was a blueprint that was rolled out. There have been changes in government in Estonia over the, the 20 years, but the same fidelity to that blueprint has remained. What is it that has made, what is it about the people of Estonia that has made them remain true to that plan, even as they keep changing politically? Because the results were imminent. I mean, first, for example, we took papers away from government meeting and government started to use computerized system. And it paid back in three months by really getting many positive reviews in Western newspapers. And we didn't have to buy advertisements, I mean Estonia positively transforming or something. Mm -hmm. People were everywhere writing about this government without papers. We were frankly astonished because, as I said, every bank was operating this way by, mm -hmm. the, by that time. But we realized it paid off. And we used this argument when we were uh, uh, deciding to do the digital ID because Minister of Finance, of course, was very much against because we couldn't demonstrate for them where's the return on this investment. They couldn't, we couldn't imagine, I mean, what will happen. But we managed to convince them by demonstrating that, I mean, the government system already had paid itself back. So definitely there will be benefits. And, and we, we then decided. And then indeed, I mean, because the banks also took this digital ID as a gateway to their services and telecoms and all others because they realized it's better than having your own kind of uh, codes and identities because it had government guarantee. And government had legally also set the framework which guaranteed the safety of access online through this digital ID and it's encrypted when you use it as well. And everybody saw the value in it. So private sector actually came on board. And, and made this development sustainable because government was relatively slow with its rollout. I believe that, I mean, ID happened 2001 mm. and maybe by 2005 we felt that most government services are interlinked and online. But private sector sustained us for this period that people did not get disappointed in the digital ID and they also got to, I mean, started to use it and realized that, I mean, there are benefits in having just one access tool for every service in the country, also having an encrypted format for it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how, how does a normal person realize it? I mean, they are in encrypted format, do you want to know? I can tell you. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you order plane tickets over, over, over uh, an online page and pay with your credit card, they send you advertisements for next three months whether you want to fly again to the same spot. Same about booking.com and all these things. Yep. But if you are lo logging in with your digital ID, and let's say buying uh, solar cells from a uh, from, uh, solar cells company. And they are also signing the document with their digital ID. And then you enter your bank and pay with your digital ID through your bank link. Nobody sends you advertisements. Hmm. They are not listening in. That proves to people that it's a so safe it's secure. It's a secure. It is secure, yes. Right. And that's why, I mean, well, everybody has been keeping doing it because mm -hmm. it, I mean, simply pays back very well. Sure. There are many processes which involve people, right? And one of the issues, if we're just drawing parallels here on the continent, one of the issues that we often have to deal with is corruption. How, if that was a present issue, or if it was a past issue in, in Estonia, was government able to deal with that? Digital alone, even if it's a transparent and easy to monitor model, 
does not change your governance culture. Mm -hmm. This is unfortunately, which I always have to tell people. I mean, you have to have strong, independent institutions. And I mean, you have to have police who has the right to take the city mayor or the biggest town in the country and question, why did you do this and that, and send them to court if necessary. You have to have a system which removes the, uh, the indemnity from a member of a parliament if they have been, I mean, wasting government money. Mm -hmm. and, and this needs to happen if things go on so that people realize that, I mean, institutions are strong and they protect you and they're able to protect you. And, and this is what we have been doing. So I'm, I'm sorry to say this has nothing to do with digital development. This is totally separate thing. Because, I mean, you can digitalize whichever type of bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have, for example, a heavy and cumbersome bureaucracy and you simply digitalize it, you will get a very efficient and effective cumbersome bureaucracy, which might be even <laughs> more difficult to tolerate. So uh, uh, transformation uh, does not change the uh, governance culture in any country. You have to work on that uh, yourself. Mm -hmm. So the the culture of governance and the culture of making sure that people are doing things ethically, you said it, it's a big thing. And you've also mentioned something important, making sure that you have independent and strong institutions. How do you guarantee that independence? We have very many independent institutions in this country, but I think the question is whether the, the independence of those institutions is guaranteed from political interference. Uh, here, uh, your role, my friends, from media comes in very strongly. I mean. You cannot repress an institution if there is free media in a country because, I mean, they will, they will yell up from the rooftops that something's fishy. And we have in Estonia fierce and, and free media. And, and if you look at the media freedom index, it's really high there, I think in the low teens or something like that. And, and this is what guarantees also that uh, you cannot touch the institutions because, I mean, they are protected by society as a whole and also by free media. And this is why you very often see that if countries, well, start to stray from this kind of good path of development, then they go after their free media. For me, this is always this kind of a canary bird situation, that if, if free media feels they are suppressed, something fishy is going on with governance in the country. And, and in Estonia, our media is extremely free. Uh, I can tell you all politicians basically don't like it. I mean, who, how can you like? I mean, uh, everybody <laughs> asking nasty questions and, and feeling very comfortable in asking these nasty questions, and you have to answer every one of them. Mm. But this is the price you pay, I mean, for keeping your institutions in independent and strong. You, you know, there's the path that was followed to get to this point. Because human nature, given what it is and how it is, there are things human beings simply don't like. If you're in a position of authority and power, you would like people to sort of like do what it is that you expect them to do. How is it that as a people you have embraced this culture that brings about the level of accountability that you're speaking of? Actually, uh, we realized that, I mean, if we want to be part of the free world where rights are respected, freedoms are respected, media is free, institutions are independent, they only accept us even to trade with us if we are like that. And, and we wanted to be members of the European Union. So, I mean, instead of convincing each and every Estonian that corruption is bad and free media is good, we convinced them that, I mean, we need access to this strong market, I mean, of the European Union, otherwise we cannot grow our economy. And mm -hmm. as I said, we were extremely poor at that time. Mm -hmm. So people really went along with all of this changing, mostly for, I mean, economic benefit. And all Estonians also realized that being member of the European Union allows us also to aspire to be member of NATO and all this together is also a security blanket, I mean, for Estonia, so that the Iron Curtain can never fall again. Mm -hmm. So initially we didn't bother to convince our people very much about the rule of law. And it's very interesting that, I mean, our constitution is very strong on rule of law and so on. Mm -hmm. But now, a couple of years ago, we suddenly had kind of a public discussion about personal freedoms and rule of law and, uh, and, uh, and even free media because we simply hadn't had it 30 years ago. So coming to a certain age, having a certain economic, I mean, capability already, people now kind of atavistically reverted to the discussion which they should have had when we were appro approving our constitution in <laughs> 1992, <laughs> but which then nobody did because it was Estonian constitution. We simply approved it. We didn't, yeah. we didn't compare it, okay? It gives the uh, minorities these rights, I mean, gay rights, I mean, all this. 
and people didn't question it. And then, then suddenly came back to it uh, uh, <laughs> decades later, and, and we had this discussion. And they started but, to poke uh, holes. Yeah. But a president, I'm intrigued by Estonia's political system. It's a parliamentary system. Yes. You as a president are the head of state, and then the prime minister is the head of government. First of all, uh, it's a big congratulations for having president and prime minister, who are both women, leading this country. Mm. Now, back to the political uh, question. How is it that a country so small with such a sh few number of voters cannot have just two or three dominant political parties, that it has to be led by a coalition of parties? It's the electoral model. It's a modified taunt model, which actually makes sure that, I mean, uh, the, the parliament has a high number of parties within it, which means that all political views in Estonia are represented through parliament. And then in the, in the parliament, they have to gather a majority, a simple majority to form a government. But because you have many fractions, four, four has been minimum. And then we were already worried that it's too low a number. Mm -hmm. Six is pretty normal. Uh, five is current. And, and then they have to form a coalition, which again means that, I mean, no government can be, I mean, straightforward left or right thing or for openness or totally for kind of closedness. It, it has to be a coalition. And, and this also guarantees this kind of stability in developments that, I mean, there are never revolutions. There is this conservative path of anticipating where the world is, gro is going and trying to kind of uh, anticipate and react before you need a revolution or a, rad a radical change. Mm. So it's a very balanced model. And now for the president's role to elect the president, you need an absolute majority. Mm. So coalition cannot do it. It has to be a kind of a broader political consensus. And, and this also guarantees president uh, a certain independence to pinpoint, even if your power is, is legally quite small, mm -hmm. but you can pinpoint and show light to the issues where, as a society, we, might, we must pay more attention. And this is the role of every president, which normally makes them relatively unpopular when they are in the office with the politicians, but popular with people, mm -hmm. which of course helps, I mean, to, mm -hmm. to, to carry out this role. It seems to be the fate of all of us elected <laughs> this way. And, uh, and I, really, I really feel that, at least for Estonians, this kind of uh, parliamentary model works really well. Hmm. Have you been able, has the country been able to then to keep politics out of government business? No, politics is in the government mm -hmm. business, but I mean, there are different colors of, of politicians in the government. Mm -hmm. And when, when, you, when you have to argue about, I mean, where we go, then normally the consensus is centered pretty much in the center of where you could go. For example, we have really heated debates in Estonia about an issue which is important here as well. I mean, you are a country which regrets its deforestation and tries to reforest yourself. Mm -hmm. We are a country which is 60% covered with wood. Mm. And we have very bitter debates about, I mean, how much we can cut this wood. Both sides are strong. I mean, some have more money, others are louder. And, mm -hmm. and, and finally, <laughs> we are basically staying on the main course while we are all the time arguing. Mm -hmm. It looks nasty, but we stay the course, mm -hmm. I believe, which is more or less balanced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is, I mean, a modus operandi for this kind of a, of a, of a multipolar political, uh, political world in mm -hmm. Estonia. And also, of course, we have to, we try to then well, technologically to support, uh, I mean, sustainable development. For example, also here we have an Estonian company, Timbetter, who is working on um, an environmentally kind of beneficial logging. And I just yesterday asked, could you also ask, with re uh, well, help with reforestation projects? Mm -hmm. And they said, yes, they think, they are now thinking of a system where they could also electronically help to handle and manage reforestation process. So How would that be done? Uh, this country, we've been talking about, you know, reforesting the country and getting to a certain forest cover. You have 60% forest cover in your country. We have, we are struggling to get to 10% and maintain that. So how would the companies, how would Estonian, Estonian private sector and even your government be able to help us um, improve this? And you're saying electronically. Yes, uh, what, uh, this is by the way not government, this is a private sector uh, enterprise. They work also with, for example, Latin American huge uh, timber, timber companies. What they do is that when somebody cuts the logs, and then they provide the company with a system which they take a photo with their mobile phone and they immediately measure what is there, what quality it is, mm. and it goes into the central database. So nobody can lie, nobody can steal. I mean, it's all very visible and transparent and also efficient. There will be no losses because if you know what you're bringing out of the wood, you already can sell different parts to different factories which do different things to it. And, and, and they yesterday explained to me that they are now thinking about how to make a same 
kind of controllable, transparent framework for reforestation. Don't ask me, ask, on, uh, ask Timbeter to come here and explain <laughs> to you in a, in a closer detail. Yep. Because in principle, a politician in Estonia is a dumb user of the ele electronic systems because, I mean, they are all built by private sector. We are smart, uh, smart uh, users. prosecutors. Mm. And, and then the, how, how the black box box functions. Well, I have two degrees, genetic engineering and MBA. Mm. I don't know what this was in these <laughs> things, but they do what we ask them to do. And they are also able to demonstrate to us that we can trust that they don't sneak our data away, which, mm. which is also an important element, trusted connectivity. Right. You have to know who controls the technology and the data. And, uh, and we just had Tallinn Digital Summit uh, with OECD, European Union, US present, and started to build uh, Tallinn consensus about how we want to see that in 21st century, we are sure that we can trust our connections. Mm. Mm. Like today, we trust all these uh, geopositioning systems, the GPS, yep. because yeah. it's run by a democracy. My son thinks it's a natural resource, by the way, <laughs> and, and, and it isn't. And and, and it's run by a democracy. Therefore, the threshold to cut off the service to get your political objectives is extremely high. Oh, it's yeah. so high, we've never seen it. Mm. This is what we now need for 4G, 5G, all this connectivity. Mm. That technology always does what we ask it to do and explains to us that it doesn't do anything more. Mm. Estonia. Please go ahead and do. All right. So, I mean, you did mention uh, briefly about the, the seamless operation between private sector and public. How has that and why was it important to have this seamless movement between the two? Uh, precisely because then you don't understand that government has to be less developed than private sector, for example, in technology. And if, if people ask me what is the biggest reason why Estonia is this digitally transformed nation, my answer is we have no segregation in labor market between private and public sector. In Estonia, I mean, you are not, uh, you, your, your pension is not better if you stay in the same sector or same company all your life. Mm. We, we do not penalize people for being adventurous, moving between public and private sector. Actually, you cannot be a good leader in public sector if you have not uh, some experience in private sector. It's held against you. So we have no segregation in our labor force. And it's very uh, unexpected answer, I know. But mm. this is the reason, I mean, we, we go hand in hand because most of us have experience in, uh, in various sectors. I, I have worked in telecoms, energy sector, investment banking, and then advised prime minister, then been an European Court of Auditor member, and now president. So we all have this kind of various, uh, various uh, jobs. And that means that uh, we know each other. And also nowadays, if you think about, uh, for example, European Union agreed a certain uh, rule set for digital services, most governments regulated this alien thing, private sector. Estonia regulated itself. The government also had to make sure that the GDPR, the European Union rule set, applies to our own services, which means you are not regulating unknowing what you are doing to those service providers because we are with them, we are one of them, and the private sector is with us in all of it. Estonia has opened up its higher education sector, the university sector, tremendously. What I'm thinking, and I, this is what I need to ask, is how exactly does Estonia handle their immigration issues with relation to A, higher education input from other parts of the world, them joining the workforce in Estonia and being part of that community? There are two models of uh, involving people in your economy and in your education system. One is everybody comes to your country. The other is our companies go and hire people elsewhere. Yes. And our universities also offer quite a lot of mocks and I mean online, online courses, of course. But indeed, I mean, we are, we are of course also striving to have more talent in our country and therefore we have uh, created such a system like Startup Visa. And, and if you are working in a sector where something is growing quickly, it can be turnover, it can be profit or even the number of people working for you, you have an easy access to global workforce and you can ask people to work uh, in, in our country. Uh, and, and that people know Estonia very well and, and also the startup visa system is, is a result of another project. Estonia offers e-residency, mm -hmm. which means that the uh, access to this digital ecosystem is given to trusted people. We check their background, by the mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Trusted people uh, 
from third countries. They don't have to be European Union uh, countries neither. I mean. And we have many uh, e-residents who establish companies in Estonia without ever setting their foot in mm. the country. Mm. Uh, you can work in Estonian company if you are an e-resident and if you are not it's difficult because you have to log in you know with, mm. with all these mm. things all the time. And this way e-residency also creates an opportunity to participate in our workforce. And I mean this way we have seen what the others are starting to see now that the global services on online market exists and it is totally free and well developed. You know why? Because mm. nobody bothered to regulate it because nobody noticed. <laughs> now my worry is that when we start to take notice and, and, and it's rightly so that we have to regulate to a certain extent. Yep. But I mean, I wanted to not to regulate so what's being closed. For example, if you have European cloud of data, mm. I still want that designers from Kenya or bookkeepers from Australia or, or from wherever world can have access to my data. Mm. I mean, controlled access, of course. Mm -hmm but access to offer services into this European cloud. Mm. High risk is that we regulate it so that this market opportunity will be closed. That is a second big element which I'm very sensitive about. Now, if I have, let's say, 1,000 bookkeepers working in Estonia from Kenya, mm. how internationally, I mean, I maybe pay them into their PayPal account, how can they declare to your tax board yep. mm. and, 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 and assure your tax board that this is all I paid them? Right. I mean, we need to internationally think about it because what I don't want is that to ignore the problem that if, if I simply pay into a PayPal account, these people in your country, I mean, they have the resources, but they have to go without social security system. Mm. So I would be actually, I mean, treating your country unfairly because, yep. I mean, we will get the economic benefits, but you will oh, be left with, the, with these people in your hands not knowing that actually they could participate in your social system. And, and this is globally a big issue, which I always rise when I'm at multilateral fora in the European Union, also in OECD, that we have to create a model where we do not kill this services market, but allow the social benefits to be really used, uh, used uh, by both countries where people work and where people live. A global digital nomad will find a solution. Mm -hmm. But if we do not facilitate their remaining part of also our social security system, the richer ones go private and the, and the poorer ones simply go without. And, and it's a global have. conversation, Madam President, because just like you're talking about this, it's about where is the company domiciled and are they paying taxes locally? If That's the same way we're saying. If we get some Kenyans becoming e-residents of Estonia and working for Estonia, you're paying them, yet they are using our services, they're using the local services. How does Kenya benefit from this? You say you raise this all the time at every forum that you have an opportunity to. What are you reading? Is there, is there, are the world leaders seeing what you're saying? Uh, company level, yes, because there is now an agreement that corporate income tax will be globally harmonized. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and co company-wise, yes. But we have to realize that in this digital world, I mean, people don't have any more to assemble into companies to raise their productivity. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't have to. And, and they can instead, I mean, if you are a good specialist, you can offer your services globally. You may work at the same time in Australia, in Kenya, in America. And, and we need also to create models for these independent uh, service providers. I mean, of course, they can all create companies and, and, and some of them might choose to create them in Estonia, some here in Kenya. Then it is very easy. I mean, this international regulation will apply to them. But what to do about those who are independently working and who are not interested in creating companies, but also probably realize that they need to be part of the social security system and how to make this kind of work uh, very well seamlessly. In addition, what you have is that, I mean, they work intermittently and mm -hmm. most of our uh, social systems demand industrial area work pattern. Yep. Nine to five, a, a certain address where you work mm -hmm. and a certain address where you live and then, you know, you, in one you pay taxes, other you receive services. Yeah. They don't live this way. <laughs> so we have to offer them more flexible kind of safe hub of a state, which I mean, gets the taxes and provides services globally. Because mm. in addition, these people never live in one place. I mean, they live also globally. Yeah, well, and, and in Estonia, we are, for example, offering also an opportunity to keep your child in Estonian school with some online support and, uh, and help uh, uh, to pass Estonian curriculum wherever you are globally. For example, I, I've, I've seen also here in Kenya, uh, our honorary consul says me that uh, her kid uh, is in school in Estonia. Mm only because we have this system. Mm. She heard it from me that we have it in some speech. I mentioned it, looked it up, 
And of course, it takes a lot of effort from parents because partially it would be homeschooling, mm -hmm. even if the child could log in into, into a classroom and so on. Yeah. Some schools in Estonia offer this opportunity. But I mean, this is the way of thinking. I mean, we allow our citizens to roam globally. European Union labor market is free. Mm -hmm. We have to follow my citizen with services. They have to be able to vote online. This mm -hmm. is elementary, but they have to also be able to school online their kids and so on. And we have to find a common model. And here now international community comes in, in agreeing how then taxes are dist uh, distributed and how the services are offered. Mm -hmm. We're having a conversation with uh, Her Excellency Kirsty Kalulaid. She is the president of the Republic of Estonia. She is right here in the Situation Room on Spice FM. We're also live on KTN Home, on KTN News. We're live streaming the show all over the world on our digital platforms. Your Excellency, allow me now to plug in Kenya nicely. We have a well-educated population. We, have, uh, we are very well-placed geographically. Kenya is actually, if not the leading, one of the leading IT and innovation hubs in Africa. Now, you've talked about very many opportunities, for example, e-residency and Kenyans being able to um, apply, and then, of course, you'll vet them. What other ways can this population in this country benefit or even contribute to this global conversation about digitization? For example, we are very good with online jobs. We both can contribute uh, to the global community. And we were, for example, yesterday discussing with President Kenyatta that... Uh, uh, we need to make sure that globally no child gets lost, that we know who is born where to whom. So we could offer them vaccination, education, monitor there is no child trafficking, etc. And, and this can only happen if globally we register the birth of every baby online. Estonians do it, but we are not a good example because uh, everybody says, but you are in Europe and you are rich and, and all this. Yes. But there are little hubs of digital development where digital IDs actually exist, and Kenya is one of those. So Kenya could be the role model for the rest of the continent. And, and also, I think you have some other conditions which are met to operate a, a kind of mobile registration into a population regi registry of babies because you use M-Pesa. And you don't need, I mean, much more complicated system mm. to register the birth of a baby, for example. And this way you get the digital citizen when you get the citizen and, you, and they grow up digital. And then you can actually, I mean, offer them all other services. And because you have this digital ID, you are able to demonstrate to all your neighbors, I mean, how this can be properly done, that, I mean, people have easy access to, to services and government is not leaving anyone behind. Mm. And, 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 and we found that this could be a really something where we could together contribute to the global development, for example. And of course, there are numerous other ways. I mean, if you move forward with, uh, with uh, digital service provision, your colleagues, particularly in the uh, East African community, definitely will follow. You plug in nicely into Smart Africa, of course. Yeah. And, and I've never seen in any multilateral forum a bigger willingness to use technology to leapfrog than mm -hmm. African Union summit. I mean, there is such a readiness to move ahead, but many countries do not know where to begin. And you serve as a local role model, I believe. And mm -hmm. of course, I mean, it's also, what I can also say is that economically, of course, the first ones always win. <laughs> so if you move faster, <laughs> it will not only be a role model, but also a beneficial first way to post. develop your economy. And, and I really, uh, I trust uh, this local kind of digital thinking to really allow you to move forward. Yeah. We thank you very much for joining us, Your Excellency. You have been told that uh, you need to leave and we appreciate that you've come to us. You're going to the Strathmore University later today. Uh, just tell us about the program that you have. Well, uh, I'm, meanwhile, I'm also going to meet several UN bodies. And mm -hmm. then in the university, we can will discuss digital development and opportunities on, uh, on leapfrogging. With that, later we'll have a business seminar because we don't have not only, I mean, companies who do public digital services provision, but as I already talked about Space Trip and, and Team Better, we have others with us who are seeking, uh, seeking uh, their niche in, in Kenyan ecosystem. And, for example, we are launching with OPIC, uh, which is an Estonian... Uh, uh, education uh, startup, a program here where they are digitizing all Kenyan school curriculum to have it, I mean, digitally available. I mean, textbooks and also exercise books and all this. So you can, from online, teachers can send exercises. Mm -hmm. Imagine what the opportunity for really egalitarian school system creation mm -hmm. this gives you. 
So this is also part of the program, mm -hmm. for example. So there are many opportunities, follow us what we're doing and, uh, and you see that we can really do many things, but always together, because you know, Estonian companies are tiny. They are very beneficial partners because they need local partners. Mm -hmm. Our workforce is extremely tiny, mm -hmm. 650,000 people, Bolt alone, uh, actually, which is also Estonian uh, mm -hmm. unicorn, they have 300,000 people in their workforce. I mean, Estonian companies always hire locally. And this, I believe, is also a benefit for, for close cooperation. Indeed it is. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for joining us in the Situation Room today. And as you go back to Estonia, as you say goodbye to office, because this is your final trip as president. Yes. What do you want to do after this? I already have promised to Secretary General of UN, Antonio Guterres, to remain for two years the global advocate for women and children. Mm -hmm. We want to work on nutrition, maternal mortality issues, but also how to use new technologies then uh, to promote indeed the same child registration mm -hmm. and how to then offer services, uh, services online. Also, for example, in fighting maternal mortality, digital tools, web doctors, for example, are the main tool which you currently can use, for example, in Afghanistan. So, yeah. so uh, I, I already have a few such roles. I'm also trying to bring together Estonian business to spend 2% on, on R and, uh, and D. We, I brought together Estonian parties to make a promise that government spends at least 1% of GDP on, on, on R and D. Now the private sector needs to reciprocate, so I'm now trying to work with them. And then we have a wonderful school, which is a coding school uh, in uh, least developed part of Estonia and uh, really an industrial area which loses uh, their oil shale industry because we go green nowadays mm -hmm. and and this is a programming school and I promised to help them uh, the way any way I can so yeah. you, you see I have many projects have ongoing <laughs> but uh, but still uh, there will be space certainly for more mm. so I'm looking uh, well uh, into yes. the future yes. how does your interest in beekeeping <laughs> fit into all this <laughs> Ecology and, and, and saving this planet is the biggest global worry uh, where it is very, uh, I mean, difficult to bring in, I mean, this kind of wider public because wider public needs symbols. Bees are very nice symbols. Mm -hmm. I mean, they lose their space in, in countryside ecosystems, but we can bring them into the town, where, by the way, there are less poisons than mm -hmm. you have sometimes on the fields and so on. So they are my, my ambassadors of, of clean nature mm -hmm. uh, to Estonian capital and also to our discourse about uh, green change and the need for it. The environment. Thank you very much. Asante Sana for joining us. We Thank wish you. you a lovely day. Thank you. Indeed, that is the president of Estonia, Karsti Karjulaid, who was speaking ex exclusively on Spice FM right here at the Standard Group. Remember, this is a visit by the president of the Republic of Estonia, Karsti Karjulaid, who arrived in the country on Thursday, the 9th of September, that is yesterday, for a three-day state visit. Uh, the Estonian president, Karsti Karjulaid, has a while ago visited the Standard Group PLC headquarters along Mombasa Road here in Nairobi. Kenya. She was received by the CEO of the Standard Group PLC, Orlando Liomu, and signed the visitor's book at the CEO's boardroom. She was also given a tour of the Standard Group premier, or rather the Standard Group offices in the new converged newsroom before heading for that exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview uh, on Spice FM. This is the first, or rather her maiden official visit to Kenya and her first trip to Africa. And her visit carries a lot of significance. Remember, she is also the first female president of the Republic of Estonia, a country in Europe. She held bilateral talks on Thursday with President Uhuru Kenyatta, and both, and both states are discussed partnerships uh, in various sectors, especially in ICT, information communication technology, and innovation, a matter that the President Carrie Lyde has said is close to her heart, having worked in the telecom industry, ICT, investment banking, before becoming the President of Estonia. She also uh, focused on, rather the tour, her tour also focused uh, on e-services and Estonia is a global pace setter on matters ICT. The bilateral deals were signed yesterday at State House Nairobi on political consultations held and the environment by between President Uhuru Kenyatta of the Republic of Kenya and Kirsty Karilaid of the Republic of Estonia. Later on yesterday in the evening, there was a cocktail uh, party where President Uhuru Kenyatta hosted his 
host, uh, or rather his guest, that is President Kirsty Karilide, and they discussed on matters, uh, you know, they both said that Kenya and Estonia will partner in championing for the protection of multilateral Terrorism and on the global stage. Those are live pictures of President Kirsty Karilide. And Sophia Onuna, my uh, colleague, is speaking to her one on one. Let's go. Um, of course, you've discussed a variety of issues with my colleagues there, but first, perhaps to say congratulations to you uh, for being honored by the UN as an advocate for gender, um, women, and children. And we'll start with just asking what this means in as far as gender parity and the welfare of children is big around the world. So for you, with this um, advocate you know, title, what do you hope to do? Uh, I hope to do and will do a lot of straight talking. For example, during the pandemic, so we have fallen back on women and children's opportunities and, and rights globally in the best developed countries and in the least developed countries. But I mean, if you roll back from 90% to 80, it's not too bad. But if you go from 10 to minus 2, it's horrible. And this is where we now are. We are not on track with our nutrition goals. Uh, many mothers lost access to, uh, to matern maternity services uh, during this pandemic. So first of all, we need to be very open about. Then we need to understand the root causes. Mm -hmm. And then we need to make sure that we use also nowadays technology, for example, to register every birth globally yeah. by mobile phone so that we know who we need to vaccinate, who we need to send to school. Then we can try to see what we can do with the girls schooling. Sometimes it's not safe to go to school. Here in Kenya, for example, Estonian company OPIC is digitalizing all your curriculum yeah. so kids can learn home if it's not safe for various reasons to go to the school, for example. Yeah. So we try to promote this kind of technological approach and data led approach. For example, if uh, mothers are dying in childbirth and the numbers look identical uh, uh, statistically, there may be very varied root causes. Somewhere there are simply no doctors, then we can train doctors and midwives. Somewhere people are not allowed to go to doctors. Then we need to put political pressure on local leadership that they are taken to doctors. Yeah. So you see, we need to really use the data masses which we have, World Health Organization has, many UN bodies have, and try to pinpoint what we can do. Even with the resources we have, we can be more efficient. Right. And I know you have a business schedule. One more question. You are president, prime minister is female, gender parity around the world continues to be a challenge. As a country, and many countries around the world, patriarchal societies where the men, you know, it's a boys club largely when it comes to positions of leadership. Even here in Kenya, trying to have that uh, system where there are more women in leadership and uh, steering the agenda of running the country and, of course, uh, corporate organizations for your country, perhaps, and others. How is it you've been able to get to the place you have and what is it you'd encourage and say is what would incorporate uh, the gender agenda as well in leading a country? First, you have to recognize that the problem has not gone away I and mean, that gender parity is not achieved even if half of the government is, is female. Right. And you see that this is not achieved also, by the way, if you look at, at which kind of political movements gain popularity when there are many, many women in, in uh, government, like in Finland and Estonia, mm. you, you notice that the conservative, slightly misogynic approach I mean, also becomes a little bit more popular. Mm. And also, if you, for example, go to multilateral fora and you are a woman leader, you're very often mistaken for a note taker. And it's so important to I be... <laughs> exactly. I've, I've, I've heard, I'm, I'm, I've felt it myself and one of my colleagues, in, even in a high-level women's week, I mean, came in the room and was asked, where's the prime minister? She was. Oh, well. But she was still asked this question. <laughs> and we need to be open about these things and also be very concrete that we don't accept that, okay, yes, I understand. I look, I mean, I'm young and I look, uh, and I'm a woman. Therefore, yeah. I understand why you mis mistook me for somebody else. We cannot. What we can do for our daughters and granddaughters is exactly this push back and talk openly what, what, what is going on in the society. Lots of this gender uh, bias, by the way, is unconscious. Mm. And this is the part of the society with whom you can work the easiest because if people simply don't recognize that they are using their unconscious gender bias in, in charging, mm. then it is easier to change than when it is kind of a straightforward oppression of women. And, and we always need to be careful to distinguish and then, of course, deal with the lower hanging fruits, but tramp your legs and, I mean, and your feet really strong if you see kind of specific misogynic approach to anybody, wherever. Right. I promise never to be silent if I see it. Exactly. And that's the spirit. Thank you very much Thank for you. making time for Thank us.
Thank you very much. We have there the president of Estonia. Sorry about that. Speaking to us this morning, George Moringa here on News Center. Just being able to get a glimpse, and of course earlier she was with our colleagues at Spice FM, of that which has been a disruption in as far as governance is concerned. The first fully digitally transformed country uh, in the world. So that is huge, uh, George. And I'm sure you have more updates in terms of recapping some of what the president has been talking about this morning. Absolutely. Sophia Wanuna, acting editor, broadcast and anchor here at KTN News, having that exclusive interview with the President of the Republic of Estonia, Kirsty Karilaid, who, remember, had an exclusive other interview on Spice FM right here at the Standard Group. And this was preceded by her visit uh, to the Standard Group uh, headquarters, head office right here along Mombasa Road in Nairobi, Kenya, where she was received by the CEO. And on Spice FM, she's spoken about uh, the partnerships that Kenya will be having with Estonia on matters. ICT. Remember that Estonia is a pace setter, global pace setter on matters ICT. That exclusive interview, you can catch them on our website, on YouTube, as well as on ktnews.com. You're watching News Center. We want to take a short commercial break, but I'll be back with more details and new news and stories for you with me, George Maringa. Do stay with us.